welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the podcast ministry of Gospel of Grace Fellowship, a non-denominational Christian church in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. This is Jessica Kramis, your host for today. This week, we have a replay of an episode that first aired last year about the Lord's Prayer. Going forward, we are going to start a series on prayer. We will discuss Dutch Sheets' book on intercessory prayer, and we also are going to discuss Priscilla Shearer's book, Fervent. We want to just give you this nice foundation for what prayer is as we walk through the Lord's Prayer. Here is Bob DeWay and our discussion of the Lord's Prayer. Now, we promised that we'd talk a little bit about the Lord's, Lord's Prayer. Yes, and here we, we made it. Here we are. Here we are. And that begins here. I want to begin with Matthew 6 and verse 7. Okay. The last few days, knowing that we're going to be recording, I broke this all out and looked up every Greek word and tried to make sure I understood what the correct translation is. And ironically and sadly, the Lord's Prayer has been turned into a shamanistic babble repetition by people trying to ward off evil. Wow. Okay. And uh, frankly, I, I blame Roman Catholicism for a lot of that, but mm-hmm. Protestantism hasn't done too well either. Yeah. Say this over and over again. That's how you get rid of your sins or you atone for your sins. But let's look at what it does say. Matthew 6, 7. Now I'm quoting from the Lexham English Bible, which comes with my Logos Bible software. And I chose this translation because it's the most literal one I could find. I I went through the Greek first, and then, like I do in my sermons, and then I looked to find which English translation brings out, I think, the best meaning of the Greek. Okay. Now, I'm not telling you you can't trust other Bibles. I just want to use this one so we can explain the Lord's Prayer. Okay. It's hard to understand something this becomes rote. Yes. So let's look at what it does say. Matthew 6, 7. But when you pray, do not babble repetitiously like the pagans. For they think that because of their many words, they will be heard. Now that's just verse 7, Matthew 6. Lexham English Bible. Do not babble repetitiously. Babble is... Bata logeo, and okay. uh, interesting word sounds like Babel. Bata logeo. Don't just keep going over and over. Which is many, exactly what Rome tells tells people to do. Say this over and over. I thought about that. Now I, I preached on it. I thought about it, and so many of our brothers and sisters that we fellowship in our local church were saved out of Roman Catholicism. Yes. Okay, and their relatives are still stuck in it, mm-hmm. but. Can you imagine that somebody, they have sin and they feel guilty, so they go to confess. And what's the prescription to pay for your sins? Say this over and over again. Many, our, so many Our Fathers and so many Hail Marys or whatever. So the, let's talk about the Our Father part, which would be the first words of the Lord's Prayer. Okay. Uh, they're using that to punish people. Wow. Yeah, they are. And they're telling people, do it repetitiously. That way you can uh, pay for whatever sin you did. Wow. There's no such thing as once for all. Right. There's no such thing as God being a one that we know relationally through Christ, who loves us, who cares for us, who continually cleanses us. You got to keep sitting and paying for it, sitting and paying for it. Or yeah. Show you're sorry. Say, say our father and learn to say it really quick. You can get done with what they told you quickly that way. <laughs> That's not what it says. Go to the Bible. Don't believe these people. They're not talking for God. God talks for himself through the Bible. So do not babble repetitiously like the pagans. For they think that because of their many words, they'll be heard. No, God knows what we, who we are, what we think, and what we're praying. Yes. Okay. Reminds me of Elijah and the prophets of Baal who went through all kinds of contortions and their God, Baal, never did hear them. Right. Now let's go to verse 8. Therefore, do not be like them. 
Look at for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Yes. You might say, well, in which case, why ask at all? He already knows this. He'll take care of it. Don't worry. Because we're honoring God by confessing our dependence on him. Right. We're showing that we believe his promises. We, we believe that God is, has a, is personal. He's Jesus Christ in the incarnation is fully human, fully God. Called yeah. this hypostatic union. And he hears us. He hears us. He cares about us. It's relational. Yeah. Any father who, and our father's imperfect, and we're imperfect, yes, fathers, but if our child comes to us, we're going to, are we going to say, well, why don't you say that 20 times? I want to know you're, you really mean it. Wow. We wouldn't do that, would we? No. Well, would God do that? Absolutely not. Do we like it when our children ask us things so that it shows that they think we care about them and we have some wisdom? Right. Yes. How much more does the Heavenly Father love us and care about us? And he's going to take care of us. He has all power. He's omnipotent. Yeah. Yes, he knows all things. He already knows, omniscient. He knows what you need before you ask him. He even knows our thoughts and intents and everything else. But we have a relationship. Verse 9. Therefore, you pray in this way. Let me stop right there. Now, I looked that up in the Greek here the last couple of days. I was studying this. In this way, literally, utos is an adverb. It's an adverb in the Greek. And literally, in this manner. Okay. So it's not literally, saying, say this canned prayer over and over no. It's a model. Yeah, an adverb is something that modifies a verb. Yes. Which is pray. Mm -hmm. Okay. In this way, in this manner, not over and over. We're just told over and over is not what we should do. That's what the pagans do. Okay, so in this way, an adverb. Our Father who is in heaven, may your name be treated as holy. This is a really good translation. Okay. Okay, our Father who is in heaven. So God in heaven, who is a Father who loves us and cares about us and always has our best interests in mind, condescends to hear the prayers of people who are his children, his sons and daughters. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it talks about the transcendence of God. So we learn theology here and also the imminence of God. He's close at hand. So the holy creator of the universe cares about the ordinary daily needs of us. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And how many people saying to our fathers over and over even think about that? Well, they don't. So they let's, don't. Well, right now, we'll give you a chance to think about it. I want to think about it. Okay. I'm amazed when I spent this time this week, more than I have in, in a long time, going through the Greek and seeing what it says here, and then finding a good translation. So God's in heaven. He's transcendent, but he hears us. He's imminent. Both of those things are true. Yes. Okay. May your name be treated as holy. That's interesting. May your name be treated as holy. Hagiadzo uh, is a verb form, and it's in the aorist passive imperative. Treated as holy. Okay. So, the the really, and I've said this many times in my preaching, the Lord's prayer is ultimately a prayer about the return of Christ. Amen. Yes, it is. But most people don't even think of it that way. Right. And so the holiness of God's name is true. And we honor God and we pray for his name to be treated as holy, but it's blasphemed all day long. Right. It sure is. And so God is loving and patient because he tolerates sinners cursing him, blaspheming him, 
and desecrating anything that's good or right. And that goes on and on and on. So why does he do this? Why does God tolerate the blaspheming of his name when we are to pray that it be treated as holy? Because he is still allowing history to go on so that more can yet be saved before the judgment comes. Yes. So when we pray that may your name be treated as holy, we're praying that the time would come when he does return and all who refuse to treat the name of God as holy will be consigned to hell. Right. Okay. In the meantime, God allows it to save those who will believe. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's a, an imperative. May your name be treated as holy. Then may your kingdom come. Now that affirms what we've been saying about the eschatological reality that will, that is not yet. Okay. Okay. And so uh, may your kingdom come. May your kingdom come again here. May your kingdom come. Urkel my okay. time. May this come to pass. An imperative, which is exclamation point. It's important. That's what we want. May your will be done. Ginomai, in the Greek, literally means to be or to come into existence. May your will come into existence. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's not happening now. No, it, no, it sure isn't. Right. And the false teachers, which are the majority in many huge denominations, think, well, it's never going to come by Christ coming and judging and establishing the millennium and then ultimately the new heavens and new earth, the eternal order. It's going to come progressively on the earth as the church takes dominion over everything. Right. And that's a very popular teaching right now. That is utterly absurd. That's mm -hmm. not what it's saying. Okay. When the Christians have had nominal Christians power politically, they haven't treated God's name as holy. No. They blasphemed it. So if you think the name of God will be treated holy by your post-millennial fantasy, it never happens. Right. Because we still have the sinners blaspheming God. Mm -hmm. And if, we, if some uh, totalitarian Christian group decide to execute all the sinners, they still have themselves. Yes. And they're not right. <laughs> treating God as holy either. So yeah. it's a mess. No, this is a, this is a prayer for the return of Christ. Okay. May your kingdom come. You can't have the kingdom without the king. Right. The king is now ruling in heaven. Okay. So if you're saying, well, that just means he's ruling in heaven. Well, that's already true. Right. Why would we pray for something to come that is already here? Right. So he's already ruling in heaven. We're praying for the return of Christ to rule on the earth. Yes. As is promised in the scripture. Mm -hmm. Well, that's there. May your will be done on as in heaven, literally as in heaven, so also on earth. Well, now it's in heaven, Christ will come. And that's a prayer for the return of Christ. Okay. Give us, now it's talking about ordinary life in the meantime. Right. Okay. So what do we need in the meantime? Do we need to learn the secrets of being the ones who take dominion over the earth without Christ? No. Nope. No, it doesn't say that, does mm. it? What do we have in the meantime? Give us our, today, our daily bread. Yes. What? You can't think <laughs> of something more exciting than that to pray for? Right. <laughs> See? <laughs> but you amazing? know, it also shows that God cares about our daily needs and our lives. Right. He wants to hear our needs. Well, you know in the world that they lived in at the time, having bread was a big deal. You can read that 
in the Gospels, especially in John, by the way, John 6. Yeah. And you go in the Old Testament when they complained about the bread that God provided. Right. Okay, so they rebelled because, well, we had better stuff in Egypt. Yeah. Well, then in John 6, Jesus came as the bread of life, and they didn't like that either. Right. And they hated him. They didn't want mm -hmm. that. They wanted a king who could just give them endless bread so they don't have to go plant wheat anymore. Right. And so this prayer is telling us that disciples, it literally should be called the disciples' prayer, are relying on God that they may be able to have the sustenance they need every day. Yes. That they're content people. Mm -hmm. We may have different lots in life and different circumstances, but what we need is just for God to take care of us. Now, the other thing we need is forgiveness of sins. Right. And to be forgiveness, so forgiven. So okay. it says, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And that's uh, actually a pretty good translation right out of the Greek. Okay. So forgive, a fee, a fee of me, which means release. So if you release someone from debt, they're free. Yes. So we owe a debt to God. The soul that sins must die. We're facing the consequences of our own sin. The forgiveness of sins is a release. Okay. And so there's other words used. Sometimes the word for release, but here there's a form of that. Forgive is heirs active imperative. Heirs point in time, something God does. And we're saying, God, do this, forgive us. What do we need? We need daily bread and forgiveness of sins. Right. We don't need to be the rulers of the world. Yeah. Uh, as we have forgiven our debtors. So we're not going to God and say, forgive our sins, but I'm going to make anybody that ever wronged me pay. Right. That's, isn't there a parable about that? Oh, there's lots of them, actually. Yeah. And there's context here. Mm -hmm. and we, to, we won't have time to cover all that, but it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. But as we receive forgiveness, and we know that our hope is in Christ and not in this world. It helps us be kind and forgiving people. And we see that as what we need to do. Okay. Then one more thing here. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I chose L-E-B because it translates that literally, the evil one. Okay. Now, there's reasons in the context to believe that it really is talking about Satan. Okay? Okay. So Satan is the accuser. He's the tempter. Jesus had gone through temptations and resisted every one of them. Temptation is certainly thematic in Matthew. And so what that is saying is that we're not overly impressed with our own ability to stand, even though we need to. Right. And we know the story of Peter. Though everybody else denies you, I won't. Well, then when he got into the pressure, temptation, parasmos, literally means pressure, uh, just the pressure cooker, he failed, but he found forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so we're not so bold in, in this idea. I can go through anything. Send him my way. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to defeat Satan. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to tell Satan uh, to get out of my way. And I'm, well, see, that's a lot of the teaching out there, especially in the New Apostolic Reformation. Yeah. There are false teachers claiming that they're going to personally defeat Antichrist before Christ can come back. During oh, the, good grief. For seven years. Yeah. I got an email from a, a godly pastor in Israel said there's so many people teaching that. Wow. And he, uh, but no, what is it saying here? We're not so bold to say, oh, I can go through anything. I'll be fine. No, we're humbly coming before God and confessing our need. Right. And if God allows whatever he allows, he'll give us strength. Yes. So 
asking him not to bring us to temptation. He has a reason to, like Paul's thorn in the flesh, so be it, but deliver us from the evil one. Yeah. Okay. So we need God to do that. God delivers us from the evil one. And literally in the Greek, ha paneros, the evil one or the, the evil. Deliver is ruamai. Uh, I love that word too. So we broke this down, look at it in a good English translation. And what do we learn? The Lord's Prayer is not at all like the prescribed prayers of the people that are writing these books. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. It tells us something totally different. There's humility. There's dependence on God. There's the honoring of God. We're not with the Lord's Prayer saying God's hands are tied unless we do certain things or say certain things. Or that wow. God bringing holiness into our lives, depending on us gaining secret information about our past and that of our ancestors. No. About what curse is on us. No, we don't need to know that. God, make your name to be seen as holy. Amen. He does that through saving the people, sanctifying the people, and ultimately coming for them, bringing us to be with him. Okay, wow. We are out of time for this edition of Critical Issues Commentary Radio. If you'd like to contact us, you can reach us through the website, cicministry.org. Click on contact, and we would love to hear from you. There's also years worth of articles and previous podcast series you can find at the website, cicministry.org. We want to remind you to stand firm in one spirit with one mind and strive together for the faith of the gospel. For Critical Issues Commentary, this is Jessica Kramis. And Bob DeWay. We'll see you next week. 